You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Jeep Geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creepy Geeks Podcast, episode number 190. Skinwalker Ranch, X-Files Returns, More Missing Persons in the British Columbia Interior, and Wendigo 101. Yeah. So here we are again. Welcome back to Creep Geeks Podcast. Very first time tuning in. Welcome. Glad to have you here. And if you're a repeat offender, good to see you. Yeah. So we have lots of good stuff to talk about this time, as we do every time on the Creep Geeks Podcast. But this time we have a lot of cool stuff, like cooler than usual. And this is primarily <laughs> stuff that you can watch on television. Okay. Yeah. Because it's going to start getting cooler soon. The leaves are going to fall. Pumpkin spice is going to be out there for all the basic people. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> It's hot, man. I'm tired of sweating. The humidity and all that jazz, storms and all that stuff. I am tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting here, it's like, oh, let's do the podcast. Let's turn off all the ventilation so we can sit around and be all moist. And sweaty. I was just going to say moist. You can sweat. (laughs) So anyway, uh, let me adjust the my microphone because I thought I had it adjusted. But, you know. That's how it is. So, welcome to the podcast. Here we go. This episode number 190. That means 190 times we've tried to bring you broadcast excellence. <laughs> Emphasis on the uh, tried there, right? Yeah. So, anyway, uh, there's a couple different ways you can support a podcast. Supporting podcasts is pretty easy to do. We have a telephone number for you to call if you'd like to share an instance, an experience, or something you've had happen that you think everybody should know about. It's a phone number. It's toll free. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah, leave a message. It's good. Uh, You can also support the podcast by jumping in on our Facebook page. Creep Geeks Podcast. As we share memes and funny stuff like that. And if you find things that you want to share to be interesting, feel free. Yeah. And we have a website where we actually post everything we talk about on our podcast, including all the show notes with all the links and things like that. So if you want to kind of do your own research or if you're like, hmm, let me check that out. And that podcast is, our podcast, that webpage is what? Creepgeeks.com. Yep. We also have a convenient contact us link on that page. Click on that and uh, you can send us a message or reach out to us. Yeah. See, we're givers. And we have a, a pretty banging Instagram page, with Instagram pictures and stuff like that. We kind of had to redo it. Our original Instagram page got taken away once upon a time. Don't know why, but it did. Yeah. Oh, jokes on you, we're rebuilding it. And by you I mean Insta Stank. So <laughs> Instagrump. Instagramps. That's what we should start one for grandparents called Instagramps. Yeah. That'd be funny. It'd be a lot of capital letters and stuff. Blurry pictures of grandkids. <laughs> Blurry pictures and stuff. <laughs> yeah, we'll post like I don't like oatmeal. <laughs> oh crazy for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. Anyway, so we have a lot of stuff to talk about. And one of the things that we like to do is we like to talk about things we find to be interesting on the internets and maybe some things that relate to the past. And one of the things that relates to the past that kind of was a really uh, sort of pivotal point in a lot of people's lives. And if you're too young, you're probably too young. Remember this, but, you know, X-Files. Yeah. X-Files was a cool show, man. I mean, it grew. It, it sort of opened up the door. And it was the timing was good because when X-Files was going on and getting real popular, so was Art Bell. Right? Mm-hmm. And Art Bell and Coast to Coast, the original, you know, the godfather of the paranormal, the spooky, all of that stuff. You know, he sort of mainstreamed all of the stuff that you see on TV today because there was no place for it. It was, you know, if you watched anything spooky or paranormal or ghost related or anything like that, it was either a movie or a late night show. Yeah. There was no mainstream anything. But then you had X-Files came out and X-Files got big. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people watched it, and it was on uh, the Fox television station. Came out in late nineties, or no, early nineties. 
So what was it? I thought it was like ninety three or ninety six yeah, to ninety three to two thousand two. So early nineties. Yeah, and then it came back for a minute. Yeah, and it looked like it was going to come back again, but then I guess no. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, it was a great show, and you can watch it if you can find it. It's pretty good. Fox Mulder, Dana Scully, and all that stuff. And their search or their quest for the truth and what's really going on. Yep, the truth is out there. Yeah, and they covered everything from, well, kind of like this podcast. They covered anything from paranormal or unexplained events, but a heavy focus on the UFOs and government stuff, like hidden technology and things like that. So... They it, covered way more than that. Yeah, they they, they did. covered everything. Everything yeah. from portals to Wendigos to Sasquatch A to wide aliens. A spectrum to of unexplained phenomenon. Biological warfare, yeah. all sorts of stuff. The only thing it didn't really cover in great detail at all was ghosts. No, they had a couple. A couple. But yeah. that show was on forever and they didn't really cover. They covered more UFO and things like that. Mm. More conspiratorial stuff. True. So anyway, uh, it came back for a minute, and people were excited. I know I was excited, and then it just sort of went away, and then lots of stuff has happened between here and there, and, um, you know, well, according to the article you put in here, it's coming back again. Allegedly, it's going to be back. Now, the X-Files will serve up a new range of cases. This time, though, expect it to be more of a comedy. One of the reasons the original X-Files really drew people in was because it was kind of dark. It wasn't your typical television. And it was weird because, you know, like, what was it? Like, the time slot was 7 or 9 p.m. So it wasn't you weren't staying up super late to catch something super spooky. It was on right there and in, you know, prime time slot for people to get exposed to this kind of creepy phenomenon and creepy television. Well, this is going to be more kind of lighthearted. Um, one of the quotes in this is going to be like, um, it, it's going to be the X-Files' B-team. So more of a comedy, and it's going to be animated. Okay, and I'm going to tell you right now, Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> why? why? Why make it animated? I don't understand why. Okay, I... It's going to be an animated comedy spinoff that'll focus on a team covering investigations considered too ridiculous for Mulder and Scully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also going to be set in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah, the tentative name is going to be The X-Files Albuquerque. Now, we came from New Mexico and moved to Western North Carolina. And so I I can kind of get why they're going to use New Mexico for this, but... I mean, in a, uh, in a place where so much creepy happens, yeah, but see, there this are already, would be an opportunity to actually have a decent not-comedy show. Yeah, but they're not. They're making it into a comedy show. And, and it's like That's probably the only say. reason why they're, they're making reference to Albuquerque, and we don't really know exactly, is because, number one, it's hard to spell, and it's quirky in the name, right? Albuquerque. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see. I, I don't know. I would rather see the original show come back with Scully and Mulder. You know, I, I just don't know how I feel about an animated version. That's like the animated Ghostbusters. I didn't really care for that. And it's so. already getting compared to that. If you look on. The, oh, well, of course. It's going to be Ghostbusters and Scooby-Doo, right? If you look on the entertainment blogs, there's already a few of them kind of ripping this as why does this need to exist and ghostbusters already did it they already have that legacy why do we even need this and i kind of agree because like i was trying to say albuquerque and the x-files that would be a perfect opportunity to i mean redo the show well not necessarily redo it but give it a new life i mean it's in the center of the southwest it's the opportunity to explore different and new creepy but they're yeah. not going to do it. Instead, they're going to Ghostbusters it. Now, there is something alluded to in this article, and that is spinoffs for the X-Files do not do well. Uh, no. No. Because nobody mean, gives a shit <laughs> about anybody but the primary character. However, even the 2001 The Lone Gunman, which I actually thought would be good, that didn't take off either. Uh, no. Yeah. And then they did a terrible spinoff called Millennium, and you thought it was going to lead to something, and it didn't. It led nowhere. Garbage. 
So anyway, there you go. The X-Files is back. It's going to be an animated series, probably a cartoon style, maybe the Scooby-Doo sort of flavor. Like Scooby-Doo meets, meets Ghostbusters. Is that what they were saying? Um, the With X-Files the- B-Team explores cases too ridiculous for Mulder and Scully. It's an office full of misfit agents. That's the byline. Yeah, and according to what it says here, which sounds more a bit more than a bit like the X Files meets Scooby Doo. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm hoping this isn't garbage, but honestly, it's probably going to be garbage. It's 2020. What are you talking about? Hope. <laughs> yeah, it's a dumpster fire. Speaking so. of which, we do have bu- new dumpster fire stickers in the Creep Geek store. So. All right. So you had to cheapen the whole thing by Nuh-uh. far. <laughs> And we'll put links in the show notes for this podcast episode. Yeah. I don't know. So I don't like it so far. I just don't. I know. But it's excellent. I'm older. I, my time is more valuable. The older you get, the more valuable your time is. You know, because you're running out of it. And I'm thinking there may be something better to do. But I don't know. Oh. We don't even know what's going to come on. Is it supposed to be on what? That part is not in Amazon, any maybe? That's not in any of the articles I found so far. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, uh, but I just, I got super excited because I saw X Files and I saw Albuquerque and I got my, see, yeah. What you experienced was a <laughs> glimmer of nope. <laughs> not a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of nope. <sighs> I don't know. I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping it turns out to be funny and stuff like that. But, you know, it's like messing around with Star Trek and Star Wars. You know? Yeah, it, we were talking about this the other day. It's just like uh, the Fantastic Four movies; they're garbage. Why didn't they stick the original sort of you know flavor for it? No, they're not. They're not good at all. I yeah. think what Sony made those, hmm. not good. Yeah. Well, hopefully Marvel Marvel will be able to do better if they ever make Fantastic Four movies. But you know, sometimes if if for your first showing, you should probably stick somewhat to close to what people recognize. But you know, give you a little bit of nostalgia and that kind of thing. I know. It was just, again, hopes and dreams dashed. Yep. Glimmer of nope. (laughs) Anyway, moving along. uh, Is there anything to look forward to on television? (laughs) um, I was saying moving along to get to something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you just sort of wreck the whole momentum. Segway. It's not a segue if somebody is segueing to it and then you just throw it out under the bus. We're going to have to talk after after I get done with this. Someone needs you to put on your fighting trousers. Fetch my fighting trousers. Remember that? Just the cuffs. Is there Moving any? into no... Uh, <laughs> really? Yep. Okay, so the secret of Skinwalker Ranch is coming back September 6th. Yeah. It's that show that has like popular characters like Dragon... And Travis. Alpaca number two. <laughs> Alpaca number two. I think got attacked by something. You know, it's at the uh, Skinwalker Ranch, the place of mystery, the place that George Knapp made famous when he wrote the book with his buddy Kelleher about secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. The place that's supposed to be like a sort of a paranormal 14 sort of place that has everything going on everything from ufos to skinwalkers to cattle mutilations to portals to all of that stuff referred to as ufo alley since the 1950s yeah they had a show that you could watch and they were investigating the phenomena. and honestly it wasn't that good it kind of dragged on a well, little yeah. bit and i'm thinking that's kind of what happens there yeah but It was good enough to get your feet wet if you don't know anything about Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, that that whole, like, we we talk about doing a helicopter view of things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're part of the great unwashed who's never heard of Skinwalker Ranch and all the crazy stuff that happened there, then you didn't know anything about it. And then here comes, you know, these these guys' investigations, right? Or doing investigations and trying to figure out what's going on. Because Skinwalker Ranch was actually sold from Bob Bigelow to a company, right? And part of the company, um, what was it? Okay, so anyway, let's just say Bob Bigelow owned Skinwalker Ranch for a while. It was funded by the government to do all the research into the phenomenon that was occurring there. 
This is in the you know, more modern times. It has recently been sold, and now they opened up for investigations. There's a real estate tycoon in, in um, Utah, right? And and there's kind of they're filming it. They're filming what's happening here, which is what everybody always wanted is for somebody to actually film what's going on there and show what's happening. Yeah, and they did. The thing is, it seems like what's happening is that there's not really a whole lot happening. I mean, compared to everything that George Knapp documented and the book and all these anecdotal stories that we've heard on various podcasts and various radio shows. I mean, there what, is no, there was what, no various radio shows. Yeah. When George Knapp would go on Coast to Coast AM and talk about Skinwalker Ranch, that was good radio. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So compared to that content, I'm trying to remember where I was going with that. Um, it seems as though what we were given on on the television series paled significantly in comparison. Yeah. So, you know, like stories of um, whizzing around orbs and lights, but not like paranormal orbs, like tangible balls of light, uh, whizzing around, constant animal attacks, um, constant physical attacks, um, uh, trickery, like a whole trickster element going on. It just, what we saw on the show just did not, I don't know, live up to that no, reputation it, it, that was built. It reminds me of an experience that we had recently where we went to went, we went to go investigate a place that we've been to multiple times in the past and really didn't get any, any real activity because it just seems like the place was a little bit depleted. Yeah. And whether that's from lack of interaction or just the way it is, it just seemed to not be there. They did have some anomalous experiences happen during the series. Um, the first series, it was like, what, eight episodes or whatever it was. Hopefully this time, since it's coming back, it should maybe be better, I would think. Maybe they have more stuff to talk about. Yeah. I'm hoping that they pull the okie doke on us. Yeah. You know what the okie doke is? What? The okie doke is the first season, there wasn't a whole lot going on because they've been holding the good stuff to see if season two was going to show up. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, and this is off the National Geographic sort of thing. So it's going to be on History Channel, which means it'll be filmed well. And hopefully that this time around, if they've had some time between the first episode airing and the shooting of the second season, they can kind of get an idea of what people said about it. Because I like when series do that, when they, you know, put out like a limited number of, of episodes. And so when those episodes are in the can and ready to roll, the, the cast and crew, if, they, if they're working on a second series, can see what the public opinion was of those said episodes and make changes to the next episode. You know, like a lot of times season one is kind of okay, but then season two is a lot better. Yeah. I'm hoping that that's the case. I do too. And I hope this time there's a little more focus on certain things, like maybe some more of the history, the interviews with maybe um, some people on the res that border right against it. Res is short for reservation, if yeah. you're not aware. So that type of stuff I'm looking forward to. Well, I mean, it's 512 acres. You figured they'd be able to find or just tap into something. But it, yeah. it almost, it's, what it reminded me of was they talk about all their high-tech equipment and gear and stuff like that, a little command center and all that, and you know Geiger counters and stuff. But it seemed to me like if we were going to go investigate Skinwalker Ranch, that's the kind of stuff we would bring. Yeah. You know, I was expecting maybe a little bit more. You know, they have the backing of a multi-millionaire kind of a thing going on there. You think they would have more? You know, like infrared sensors, you know, night vision everywhere, all this crazy stuff. And it doesn't seem like they have as much of that as they need, maybe. Yeah, and, and they broke out with some equipment that I thought was really cool, like the ground penetrating radar sure. and the ability to dig. But then it kind of frustrated me because there was that one episode where they were intending to dig and for some reason they just didn't complete it. I don't, I don't understand really what happened that episode. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so kind of hard to say. I, I want to see more. So I've still got my fingers crossed and I still have hope for, for the series in general. Yeah. So, yeah. So it'll be coming back and hopefully it'll be better. Maybe they can fine-tune their investigation techniques, you know. I yeah. don't know. But anyway, that's coming back. It's going to be September 6th, uh, which is going to be Sunday, I think. Ooh. 
which is not that far away. It seems like this year is flying by, but not at all moving. It's, it's weird. I don't know how to describe this year. It's kind of a strange year. But that's yeah. something to look forward to. Probably one would be more interesting maybe than the X-Files cartoon. Yes, yeah, so something to actually look forward to. Yeah. Very nice. So it's just kind of funny. We're talking about the Skinwalker stuff, and we, we started talking about Skinwalkers, and we started talking about some of the other things that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes last week. Right? Yeah. Because we do that. We talk sort of what we're going to talk about on the podcast, and we kind of, you know, we, we sort of touch base and write out episodes and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, the Skinwalker thing became a thing. And now it seems like here you, you watch the next couple of days, everybody's going to be talking about Skinwalker stuff, right? Yeah. Because it makes sense because the show's coming back on. Why not talk about it? And it does have such an interesting backstory to it. But the funny thing about Skinwalker and Skinwalker Ranch in general is how Skinwalkers can kind of relate to what we're going to talk about a little bit later on. When you do a comparison between a Skinwalker and a Wendigo, what's the actual difference? What should you be looking out for? Where are they located? That kind of thing. Yeah, I put that at, yeah, later on. And, yeah, and that's coming later on, but it just seems to be that there's a correlation there. And then what I've noticed is a lot of times there's a correlation between what we talk about and what everybody else winds up talking about. Hmm. Kind of strange, right? Yeah. And sometimes the path to get from A to B and C to D and all that stuff is a circle with us because there's things that's related. And what we find is is that most things that we talk about are, are related to something else. And that's what made the whole Skinwalker Ranch thing, the whole phenomenon behind that, so good. If you liked the idea of UFOs and cattle mutilations, they had them there. If you liked the idea of possible Skinwalkers, it's called Skinwalker Ranch. You know what I mean? They have a history with that. That's there. And if you're looking at like portals and portal technologies and weird underground stuff, they had that there as well. And they had everything that people like to talk about. Like folklore and residual yeah, energy everything. and cursed land, everything. And then the show doesn't really highlight that stuff because I guess you can only highlight what you see. Yeah. But it's all sort of related. And that's the thing about 14 or 40 or however you want to pronounce it in general. Fortiana. Well, that's what some people, I mean, nobody really knows how to pronounce it. It's a made up word to begin with. <laughs> Right? Okay. But everybody sort of talks about it. And one of the things is, is that if you're going to like look into Skinwalker Ranch and all that sort of thing, you should probably take a look at the book. Yeah. And you're like, what's he talking about? What book? And the book is from Amazon, right? Guess where we get everything is from Amazon because they deliver, so we don't have to go out in the whole corona thing. So if you're interested at all in Skinwalker Ranch and the book – and George Knapp, who reported about Skinwalker Ranch and went on Coast to Coast and made that big, you should look for the book. Hunt for the Skinwalker, George Knapp and Colm Keller. Keller. Her. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, cool thing is, it is an audiobook. You can get it. You can use Audible and get it if you want. So that's just something to think about. So when you're going to drop your kids off to the living room for school, you can read that book. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, Skinwalkers, Skinwalker Ranch, Wendigos, X Files, all that stuff kind of comes together. And here's something that we've talked about in the past a couple different times, and it's Canada. Yeah. Right? And what's been going down in Canada? Because you talked about it when it comes to Indigenous people and the First Nations people, right? And the females getting taken and that sort of thing. And then we've also talked about the campers and the serial killers and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm very interested in both the Missing 411 phenomena, however, have kind of evolved from that into very specific interests. And I'm also very interested and very passionate about um, missing and murdered indigenous women. Because both those phenomena speak to something sinister. I, Yes, we're a paranormal and weird news podcast. I'm not about to hop on the supernatural bandwagon. However, it is eerily uncomfortable the amount of missing persons we have both in the indigenous community and in rural communities when it comes to certain individuals and indi indigenous groups. Yeah. Now, something that always gets overlooked is, believe it or not, Canada. Canada is such a nice and peaceful place. And as Americans, we have this stereotypical view that Canada is just beautiful and happy and nothing scary happens there. And that's well, not, I don't have that view. Well, on average. Most people do. Yes, on average. However, what I have noticed is since 
before 2017, there have been a lot of clustered missing persons cases happening in Canada. And there's no pinpointed cause to it. Now, I think it was the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, where they thought there was a serial killer on the loose, and it turned out just to be two individuals that kind of went on a murder spree. But that only covered a very small handful of cases. And now we've got something else going on in British Columbia's southern interior, where in the past couple years there have been six missing men within the same exact region. But there's no, no apparent link to these cases. Now, these missing disappearances over the last three years range from Pemberton area to east of Kamloops. And all of these men have basically... They've either been found dead or it's just been really mysterious how they've ended up disappearing. And um, anything from a burned out truck on a remote service road to just disappearing without a trace. Now, why is this hitting the news again? It's because another person has gone missing. Um, and I don't, I don't know how I feel about this because it's like, why, why do we have these well, clusters of disappearances? Okay, so the weird thing is when you talk about missing 411 and how many people go missing out of national parks, right, or let's just say government-owned land, yeah. <clears throat> it's a lot. You never hear about it, but it winds up being a lot. And when we started talking about it one time, we were shocked to find out it was over like 4,000 people missing in parks, out of parks, having never really heard, Yeah. right? And then missing 401 kind of got popular, and it sort of turned into a thing, and people started talking about it. And you've got, you know, David Polites and all that, right? And then it sort of turned into the, maybe the spiritual side of things or the, or the uh, spooky side of things, like possibility between UFO sightings at the same time as a possible Bigfoot sighting at the same time as people gone missing. The areas get searched and then bodies show up later on and there's things, weird things like their clothes are folded and shoes and all this sort of weird stuff too. And it happens all over the world. Oh, and great distances between where they disappeared and where they finally end up. Yeah, like yeah. a two-year-old disappearing one night, showing up 200 miles away. Yeah. You know, just strange, like, sort of things, like little little sort of details that make up the case that don't make sense. And the one thing that we don't necessarily hear about, like you were saying, is is Canada. We're talking about, like, you know, in the British, you know, Columbia area and Vancouver and all that. And Are these actually going to be related to the missing that happens for missing 401 because is there a correlation between that sort of thing? Cause it's, this happens in Japan as well. It happens like all over the world. So it's like, is this going to be related to it or not? Who, who knows? But I just, I just know that when we talked about it before, we talked about the two missing people in November and there's been like at least five more. And we've talked about other missing people on the other side of Canada because Canada's pretty huge. And to be honest with you, I don't know much about like provinces and all that sort of thing and interior and exterior and British Columbia versus Vancouver and all this other crazy stuff. Yeah. Provinces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, according to what they were saying is like this one person, he wound up gone, Marshall Ava, uh, Awasa. Yeah. Vanished without a trace last November. He's the burned out truck you were talking about on a forest road near Darcy. There is Columbia. It's about 150 kilometers northeast of Vancouver. They haven't found any clues at all. And then they said in the two years before he went missing, five other cases of men have gone missing. Yeah. And it kind of keeps going. And what's not necessarily being said is if you take the number of missing indigenous or First Nations women and men, and you also add that to the missing men and women we have here, it's a large number. And this is just this kind of one of those things where it's like, we'll probably never hear, you know, anything. Oh, this one's creepy. Ben Tyner, uh, last seen January 26, 2019, a working cowboy. So he's familiar with rural areas and the interior of this area. Vanished from the Merritt area after riding into the hills to look for cattle. Yeah. His abandoned horse was found fully saddled on a forest road. Uh, northwest of the city two days later. An extensive search by volunteers and police on foot, horseback, and in helicopters and on snow be- no mo- snowmobiles, no trace hmm. found. Is a serial killer eating these guys? Is Bigfoot eating these guys? I don't know. 
So don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Probably not Bigfoot. Who knows? I don't know. It's a strange thing. So we've been kind of paying attention to this just a little bit. Yeah, it's just unique because this time it's a cluster of men. So, I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. Don't know. Anyway, something we're going to keep our eye on. If you guys know anything about Canada, and there's one person I'm thinking of in particular, <laughs> you know, is this something that's just not being put out there? Or is this one of those things where you don't air your dirty laundry in public kind of thing? Because, you know, Canada is known to be polite. There's still some, you know, real, there's some issues in Canada. Every country has them. Yeah. Yeah. But there seems to be a lot of people missing. And it seems to be kind of almost around that area. So what's going on there? I don't know. We'll kind of keep an eye out and see. And that's something, too. Uh, If you know of the number of missing people from national parks, if you have a more of an accurate number for the year 2020, I'd be curious to see if it went up or not. Oh, wow. Yeah. Chances are it probably has. And again, it shouldn't. You'd think it would go down being all quarantined and stuff, but you never know. Yep. So it's entirely possible that in that area, let's just say if there is some kind of force out there, maybe it's not Bigfoot, maybe it's not UFOs, maybe it's not even a serial killer or somebody out there eating on people, maybe it's a Wendigo. Oh. Because where is it? Where, okay, so when you look at Wendigos in general, and you look at cryptids in general, they typically have an area of which they're known to be in, Right. And a lot of times, this cryptid animal, whatever it is, in this particular area, derives its name from its location and from the people that are in that particular area. They're the ones that kind of name it. Right? Yeah. So like skunk ape and things like that, you know that that's for... So anyway, it kind of goes back to like Wendigo. Like, what's an actual Wendigo? What's it look like? Where is it located? How did it get its name? That's the stuff that we're going to tell you. And we're also going to compare it to a generic term, which is not really a real term. And see if it relates to anything else, and maybe it's called something different in a different geographical location. Okay. So, what's a Wendigo? A Wendigo is a mythological creature or evil spirit from the folklore of the First Nations Algonquin tribes based in the northern forests of Nova Scotia, the east coast of Canada, and the Great Lakes region of Canada and in Wisconsin. So, yeah. yeah, the Wendigo is described as a monster with some characteristics of a human or as a spirit who has possessed a human being and made them become monstrous. Its influence is said to invoke acts of murder, insatiable greed, cannibalism, and the cultural taboos against such behaviors. Yes. So, if you look at the modern medical term, because they have a, a modical, a modern, can't even talk, a modern, a modern medical term associated to Wendigo is called Wendigo psychosis. And this is supposed to be like a culture bound syndrome where it says that you have s- symptoms of intense craving for human flesh and fear of becoming a cannibal. And in some indigenous communities, environmental destruction and insatiable greed are also seen as a manifestation of the Wendigo psychosis. I've never heard of that. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny because it seems like whenever you look at this sort of thing on places like Wikipedia or whatever, if they can throw like a medical side of things in there to kind of give you a balanced perspective, like saying, well, maybe it's not this. It could be something that's in your mind. They're doing it now. Okay. So if you have one to go psychosis, they're trying to basically say that, you know, if you're not dealing with your own problems, then you can exhibit these symptoms and then they can turn you into a Wendigo. Right. Yeah. And so if you're not dealing with your problems and you have a insatiable greed for whatever, whether it's envy or lust or any of that kind of stuff, then you can just basically disfigure and distort yourself to the point where you become a Wendigo. Right? By by taking all the bad that you should be dealing with, then you can sort of manifest a Wendigo. What does that sound like to you? Schizophrenia or no, borderline? No. As far as, not schizophrenia, I mean... More of a cryptid sense. Like, if you were to compare a Wendigo to something cryptological, it'd be compared to what? Skinwalker? Yeah. Kind of, but not really. I mean, kind of, but not really. It's the same sort of thing. I don't know. You're basically embracing the dark side of humanity, not even your own humanity, and you have to consume your humanity to become this monster. Uh, I don't Skinwalkers know. Skinwalkers need to consume their family members and everything else and embrace it to become empowered because I'm, I'm still wrapped up in that whole psychosis thing so because psychosis is a 
part of psychosis is the challenge of embracing or enveloping like all your niche problems. Like, well, that's why it's controversial. Okay. Because psychiatrists is saying as a culture, culture bound syndrome, like some of the symptoms you may exhibit would be an intense craving for human flesh. And then the fear of becoming a cannibal. Okay. And then it says in some indigenous communities, environmental destruction, (laughs) which is, Okay. And insatiable greed are also seen as a manifestation of Wendigo psychosis. Hmm. Oh, I don't buy that. I don't either. That's yeah. why it kind of runs like, okay, and that's why it's controversial. But if you look at the idea behind it, like how do you become a skinwalker? So skinwalkers, you have to basically make that agreement to become on the darker side of things and pretty much step away from your community. Yeah, which is kind of what Wendigo's same thing. It's like you're sort of all consuming and all concerned about yourself and what you're doing, and you don't care about your community or your environment. And then basically, you can turn into it. Another example to maybe relate it in a better way would be: look what happened to Gollum. Wanted that power so bad, and that ring so bad, and look what it did to him: distorted him, disfigured him, made him you know sort of a monster. Yeah. I know the same thing. I don't know. I still think there's like a distinct difference between the two. Well, like most things, right? It's like if you don't behave in the proper way, then you're going to turn into a monster. Okay. Kind of the same thing. But when they add the cannibalism side to it, that gives it just a whole different sort of thing. Yeah. And and Wendigos can't change back, can they? I have no idea. I don't think they can. Can a skinwalker? Yes. Well, Well, a skinwalker wears the skin. Yeah. Right. To have the embodiment of that particular animal. They have to do a bunch of horrific things in order to get that power. So can they truly ever go back? No. Because once you cross that line, that's it. But by plain eyes. So by plain eyes, they they can still go back to that mostly human form. Whereas a Wendigo, I don't think you actually hear of any accounts of just the, the Wendigo out and about it's always creeping up on you or attacking you, you know, solo type thing. I don't know. Well, one of the descriptions of a Wendigo, right, says the Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation. Its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones. Its bones pushing out against its skin. Complexion, uh, complexion is ash gray, like as of death. Its eyes pushed deep back into its sockets, and the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclean and suffering from separation of the flesh. The Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition of death and corruption. And some tribes actually describe it a little bit differently. They described as giants that are many times larger than human beings, a characteristic absent from the myths in other Algonquin communities. These are other tribes, like the Eastern Cree and the West Main Swampy Cree, right? And it says, whenever a Wendigo ate another person, it would grow in proportion to the meal it just ate, so it could never be full. Therefore, Wendigos are portrayed as simultaneously gluttonous and extremely thin due to starvation. So the Wendigo is seen as the embodiment of gluttony, greed, and excess, and it's never satisfied after killing, consuming one person, and they are constantly searching for new victims. Okay. So if you think about gluttony, greed, and excess, no matter how much you have, it will never be enough. And it turns you into a monster of the person you used to be. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing. It's sort of like, hey, you better live your best life, man, and do the right thing. Otherwise, if you get consumed by this, this is what can happen to you. Hmm. And they say the human Wendigos, which is the cannibals, right? In some traditions, humans overpowered by greed could turn into Wendigos, and the myth thus served as a method of encouraging cooperation and moderation. Other sources say Wendigos were created when a human resorted to cannibalism to survive. And you can also, if you're a human, turn into a Wendigo if you're in contact with a Wendigo for too long. Oh. So it kind of all goes back to the same thing. If you're not being a proper and good human, then you can turn into a Wendigo, especially if it's greed. Hmm. And when you're greedy and you don't care about others, it's you're you know you're eating them. 
So I don't know, man. Kind of strange, right? Yeah. But they are and could be compared to skinwalkers because what do skinwalkers do? Well, they're kind of a witch, though, and and it's more about I don't I don't know. It's less about the cannibalism and more about the evil magic. Yeah, but in order to become a skinwalker, a true skinwalker, you have to consume your family or, or part of your family. You have to eat the flesh of your family. Really? Yeah. They don't talk about it. We shouldn't probably be talking about it either. You know what I mean? I thought you just had to go against the community of healers and practice certain dark rituals. Uh, they may involve eating a family member. But that also goes back to there's a whole subset of um, Hindi uh, magic practitioners that do that, that eat the dead. Well, you know? they're sacrificed. Hmm. There's a whole, you know, we're talking about cultures that have sacrifice built into it. Sacrifice and cannibalism to obtain power. So they can be compared. You've got, you know, effectively, if you look at what a skinwalker versus a wendigo is. Now, are they two separate things? Probably, right? Because if you're turned into a supernatural monster, and a wendigo can be turned into a supernatural monster... It's the same sort of thing. You turn your back on your community. You do whatever it takes to get the power. It's the same thing. And the difference between really like the Wendigo and the Skinwalker would be with the Skinwalker, you would never, you could, there is the possibility you wouldn't make a mistake of being able to identify a Skinwalker versus a Wendigo. In other words, a Wendigo looks like a monster. It stays like a monster, like you were saying, can't turn back to a human, whereas a Skinwalker could be the person sitting next to you. And you may not ever know. Because the skinwalker is essentially a, a constant shapeshifter, as well as a witch. Yeah. Could so, be. yeah. And a, a lot of times, like, a dust or something like that is attributed to the skinwalkers. Well, if their shaman's gone bad, the yeah. dust is, is there, and like we've talked about on previous episodes of the podcast. You know, it could be uh, any number of things, but, you know, the dust could be poison, hallucinogen, whatever it takes. And it maybe yeah. doesn't necessarily exist with the Wendigo. But they're kind of similar. I wouldn't want to see either one of them, but it, I think a Wendigo would be super scary. Yeah. Yeah, because maybe you might be able to shoot a skinwalker. And plus the Wendigo, it's the complete loss of your humanity, whereas skinwalkers, you're transitioning into this evil creature and into the trickster element, but you retain probably all the worst parts of your humanity. Yeah. Well, you know? and here's the problem you have with the two, with, whether it be a skinwalker or a Wendigo, depending on the legend and lore from where you're from, determines what differences there are in the lore, right? Yeah. So, you know, Navajo skinwalker is, is different than, you know, like an Algonc Algonquin Wendigo. Yeah. So each tribes have their own sort of twist or spin on the entire thing. So, you know, what holds for what we're saying, what holds true for what we know about a skinwalker may be true for Navajo, but not be true for another tribe. Lakota or... You know, right. Yeah. So I don't know. But, I mean, if you break them down to their sort of core with the elements that make them, they're pretty similar. Mm. But I don't know. But, you know, let's look at when it goes. Like, has there been people who've actually encountered or had encounters with skinwalkers? Sure. Right? But has there been people that have had, had encounters with when it goes? Yeah. Because if you do a quick, easy search on the Internet, you'll find some stuff. If you look at the modern encounters of the Wendigo, if you go to somewhere like this, look at Mysterious Universe, Brent Swancer wrote an article and talks about the hairy wild man of native lore Right? Mm -hmm. And then talks about the mysterious and legendary entity known as the Wendigo, which is an animalistic, hulking beast with strange powers. These creatures have been mainstays of Native American lore for generations, and their deeds are well known in some of those tribal stories and legends that you hear. So if you kind of look at like what's going on, I mean, these things are blamed from everything from missing persons. Um, like even back in the days of the settlers, man. So this... Okay. It's something that you look at when you look at the lore, right? So if you've got natives that have been inhabiting a spot, if they're First Nations people or if they've been there forever, they already have their lore in place. And then when you have, like, some new people show up, let's just say the settlers, right? They show up and they settle. And they're seeing the same thing, too. 
is what they're seeing derived from the Native American influence, or are they actually seeing you know, like what? How does that manifestation happen? Which came first, the cryptid or the egg? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you look at what the Wendigo is, is supposed to traditionally be said to represent, according to this article, originating from myths and legends, the Native American Algonquin tribes, right in the nor- no, northern forest, forest of I've been to Nova Scotia by the way, northern for- forest of Nova Scotia, east coast of Canada, Great Lakes regions of Canada, um, it's one of the scariest creatures of the native lore. And it could be a massive hairy brute up to 15 feet tall, a mix of human and animalistic features. The Wendigo has long been said to partake in acts of murder, insatiable greed, and cannibalism. Hmm. And it's like, okay, glowing eyes, long yellowed fangs, wicked claws, long tongue, also often depicted with antlers. Which is supposed to be, you know, internally, like, you know, to that's what, yeah, and it grows taller with each kill. It's never satiated, right? One description of a Wendigo is given by a native author who says, when we talk about gaunt to the point of emaciation, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's pretty freaking scary. So I guess really the difference between, what's the difference between a skinwalker and a Wendigo if you see it? One had antlers, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It, whereas, I guess the skinwalker, it could have antlers, or it could look all like a wolf, or it could all look like your neighbor, yeah. or it could look like a very it tall It could be any owl. kind of animal that's going to be an evil omen for you, right? It could but, look like an emaciated horse. I remember that story. Yeah. yeah. It's always said to be frightening, whether you're looking at skinwalker or... Wendigo, but the Wendigo has all sorts of other powers too, like the ability to turn invisible, read minds, mimic human voices in order to draw victims away to isolated areas, as well as shape shifting powers and the ability to generate ways of profound fear. Hmm. And the origins have variations as well. It kind of depends on what turned them into a Wendigo or why they're there. So. I don't know, man. So, you know, some say the origins are that the Wendigo started as a warrior who made a deal with the devil in order to save his tribe from some unspecified calamity. And others say it's just greed and cannibalism that does it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. But there has been sightings or alleged sightings, like even into the U.S. of Wendigos and stories. But most of the stories do come up from around Canada, right? And one of the stories says, the voice calling me was a harsh, raspy, animalistic, in-tone imitation of my sister's voice who had just recently left the trip due to stress a few hours before. This sent horrendous chills down my spine, so I ran the fastest I've ever ran back towards the campsite where I heard the twigs and leaves crunching behind me. I'd finally reached the campsite when the footsteps suddenly stopped. I was relieved and slumped over to the cabin stairs Right when I slipped on a rock slipping out of the makeshift fire and it caused me to head straight into it. The blazing force of nature had burnt, almost burned my face when I was just stopped mid-fall. I hadn't gained my balance. It was as if something was hanging on to me and pulled me back. I'm not sure what it is or what it was, but my family suggests that it was my guardian angel saving me from an early death. But after that experience, I'd never gone to the same campsite again, and I didn't go camping for a few years after. What really scares me the most from back then was when we'd been leaving the site, I'd look back from the car window and saw a figure standing at the tree line, staring at me. It was lanky. It looked starved to the point of having its skin wrapped tightly against its bones. But when I looked on the pathway, the footprints were completely gone. And as I blinked and rounded the corner, it seemingly vanished into thin air. Oh, God. That's awful. There's lots of stories like that where you're out in the woods and you hear it calling you. Yeah. Mimicking that voice. But it, I don't know. That that kind of reminds me of a lot of trickster folklore, though. Well, I yeah. mean, that's attributed to Wendigo, um, skinwalkers, sirens, things like that, yep. fey folk. But the whole trickster thing, because I remember hearing a very scary story about a Wendigo basically Freaking Bigfoot. calling someone's name through the trees 
and it almost was. Didn't like Edgar Allan Poe write a story about something that kept calling his name, the character's name? I'm pretty sure that was like the Raven. Hmm. <laughs> but but it was like a a sing songy high pitch noise when yeah. they kept hearing it. So I will that, try to mimic that sound for you. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. Hello. Oh God. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So. For me, I don't know. Again, it just, for me, it separates the differences between the two creatures or whatever they are, you know. I, I still think the Wendigo is more monster. But yeah, if they're, but if they're created through the same means, greed, cannibalism. You know, cannibalism doesn't necessarily have to be true cannibalism, like eating people. You know, if you eat your own kind because you don't care about them, because they, they're nothing more to you than just food, as in they don't register high enough to be, you know, the same level as you as a person, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say if the whole thing is a metaphor, but if it's a real deal and you run across an area where you find, like, mutilations with animals and they're, uh, you know, like dead foxes and deers that their spinal cords ripped out and entrails strung from trees and claw and teeth marks and limbs ripped off bodies and stuff like that disemboweled and you see these things kind of hanging up in trees like christmas ornaments and stuff could be a wendigo if i see anything like that i'm going back and getting in the car okay and going home and you see that kind of thing in in other places too where there's been Movies and stories where people go out into the woods and they find thing, find weird things hanging from trees and they continue and then are never seen again. I just found the, the clarification. So for the skinwalkers, it's less about cannibalism and more of the breaking cultural taboos, including murder, seduction, or the corruption of a family member or a family member's grave. Yep. So it's less about the eating the person. Well, so yeah. But what are you doing? You're consuming their identity. You're just consuming the individuality. Well, it con- says you're corrupting. So, it- well, okay. So if you go against the rules and you corrupt your family member, so yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, but you know, there's been a bunch of Wendigo reports from the U.S., including in Georgia. Really? Yeah. And this report basically says a witness in this case uh, claims he spends a lot of time camping and hiking in the area with his brother. And they went out to a place where they know well, uh, kind of like where the Jacks River Trail is in, in the Kahuta Wilderness. Mm-hmm. And they searched for a spot to set up camp. They planned a two-night stay. Everything all set up. And the day after, they were going to go hiking explore uh, the Jacks River area, right? Yeah. And at night, they got the fire going. So the first night in there, they got the fire going, got dinner. They're chatting away. They heard a sound that caught their attention. And it says, according to the witness, they were very familiar with the sounds of the forest and the sounds sounded off to them. As if several people were walking around the campsite trying not to be heard. And then things got bizarre rather quickly, which is what the witness says. It says, uh, I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and we shined it in the direction where we heard the sound. Yeah. And that's what was so weird. Uh, whenever we'd fix our lights on a spot where we thought we heard the sound coming from, right, the location of the sound would suddenly change. And that's when the whistling started. I don't like that. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I was like, okay. I mean, if I'm out in the woods and I'm hearing animal noises, that's one thing. But if it starts to whistle at me, uh, that's a different kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. It says, uh, at first I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking that the wind was just throwing off the leaves around and is basically mas- making what we're hearing nothing more than just a wilderness. But Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing that, and I didn't answer because I was trying to focus hard on what each individual sound was. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive tones over and over again, and Ryan kept asking me if I heard that. And I put my finger to my lips trying to get him to keep from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight, my fists clenched, knowing that I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if anything at all, and the whistling continued for what felt like forever. But it's probably about five minutes, right? And it says, when Ryan finally yelled out in the dark in the darkness, hey, quiet, the whistling stopped. And they sat in silence for a few minutes. When the woods erupted with noise, 
Something or someone was running in a circle around the campsite. The whistling came back. It says, how could someone whistle so loudly without cracking right while they're running? And he mm-hmm. said, I was done. I stood up, shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. And that's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now, this is the part I will never forget. The part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher telling them of our location and what was going on, right? I stepped around the fire towards my tent inside my bag. I had a six-inch six blade, which I always carried and thought being a bit more comfortable having it in my hand, just more than just a flashlight. And as I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes on the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up. And there, for maybe two seconds or whatever it was, I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Oh. And everything about it was long. Its arms, its legs, its neck, its fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off the tree. And I heard it land, but either it jumped to an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I never heard. Uh, I heard it, but I never saw it. I don't think I've ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking what I saw, and I just couldn't answer. Maybe 10 minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view asking us if everything was okay. And I settled down a bit, and I started asking if they'd seen or heard anything. And all they said they heard was a lot of movement and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. And he says, I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. And then Ryan told him, we called the police roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger showed up and Ryan and I tried to explain everything to him, but he just chalked it up to either curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Hmm. That's the whistling in five feet up a tree. I'd be done. Yeah. Oh gosh. So I don't know. I mean, we've been out camping and we've had rocks thrown at us and we've heard weird stuff and, you know, basically mimicry and stuff like that. And we chalked it up to being like Sasquatch or something. I haven't, but there's only you, been. We mean you haven't. You were with us. I okay. So I haven't. What these people have experienced, I, I've had a clear separation between what these people have experienced and like our possible Sasquatch experience. Well, yeah, it's two different yeah. things. But the the whistling is what makes me uncomfortable. I have heard that three times in my whole life, and one of those times was when we went to go look for the Brown Mountain Lights in the dead of winter. Because remember yeah. I said the bone rattling in the trees yeah, and then the whistle yeah, and the rational part of me is like, oh, it's, it's the wind on the cliffs, even though we were getting more inward of the mountain away from the cliffs and I'm hearing this high pitch, scary, terrifying whistle. And I just grabbed Pepper and I grabbed the equipment wagon and I just started, you need to keep up, Greg. Because I was that scared, you know? Yeah. And the bone rattling in the trees. And I had one friend try to say, well, maybe it was a mountain lion with a deer mm, no. in the tree. And I'm like, that's, thank you for trying to help rationalize it. But yeah. I don't think that's what I heard. I don't know. It was strange because I remember that. And I just remember just thinking, don't look back and just, just get to the van. And we yeah. got to the van. You know, and it, it felt like something was walking up behind us the entire time. And then remember the light came up the trail, and yeah. I told you that, and we were done. <laughs> yeah. At that point, I was driving away. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know. And, you know, and that could be one of those things. But, see, here's the thing, though. We were there that entire time. We had some people with us, and they left. We stayed a little while longer, and then it was like it was time to go. The The entire everything changed. The invitation was revoked. Yeah. yeah. It was time to go. And and you get those feelings where you're in the wilderness and there's a time for you to be there and then there's a time for you not. And I've, I've felt that invitation. I know this seems very woo-woo right now. I've felt that invitation in many different natural environments, but I never felt it get revoked so quickly than right there. It was like we weren't supposed to be there. Yeah, it went from like when you walk into a party and everybody's like, hey, and then, you know, it cuts to like a Wild West scene where you walk into a bar and everybody stops and looks at you. Yeah. Like, why are you here? Yeah, that was a weird feeling. I didn't like that. So. So we left. But see, it's just kind of one of those things, though. But there's a couple more instances where they describe like the antlers and the long, skinny arms and all that stuff and the mimicry and the voices. 
The whistling would have creeped me out, like, real bad. And see, here's the thing, though, and here's what I always wonder. If you feed into it, like, if you acknowledge that you hear it or whatever, does it make your experience worse, or should you just turn a blind eye to it and get out of there? It kind of goes back to when you're a little kid, right? You think something creepy is under your bed. Do you look and verify and validate whatever's there? Or do you just ignore it with your blanket shield Well, and it goes away? Because everything is like that. Like, shadow men are like that too, right? If you acknowledge they're there, chances are either it's going to go away or it's going to get worse. If you just ignore it and don't feed it, like with your fear, it has sense to go away. It goes the same way, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes back to all of that, and that's what kind of makes me think all of this stuff is related somehow. Yeah. I mean, I'll definitely give that that it's all related. But I don't know. Sometimes I do think it's a different element or a different creature or is is it even a creature is it is a supernatural entity yeah i mean because is it pulling what what scares you and putting it into a context to be able to try to scare you some more (sighs) i mean if it was some you know a a weirdo dressed in animal skins wearing antlers on his head would it leave you alone if you ignored it probably not if it was like just a dude (laughs) you know we we gotta watch that that like Norwegian and, and that kind of goes movie. all the way back to the monster that was Medusa, right? If you looked yeah. her, looked at her, you turned to stone. Yeah. If you didn't look, you were okay. Mm, yeah. So everything is sort of related. So. I mean, if you really started looking into it. And yeah. to go back to one of the more recent sort of paranormal experiences, there was a, a little uh, unknown show called Doctor Who. Remember that show? Yeah. With the... Uh, the angels. Yeah, the angels, right? And if you kept your eyes open, they were frozen. They couldn't do anything to you. But as soon as you shut them, boy, they were alive. Mm. That movie, or that movie, that show was actually really creepy. That particular episode was super creepy. Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing I noticed about this article is, um, yes, we've got that account in Georgia. There's another account from Texas. I don't know if we, we go over that one or not. But for me... Wendigo territory stops, and once you hit Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, I'm like, that's all skinwalker territory. Yeah. So are they the same thing or not, you know? And I I can't get over that part. Well, here's the problem. Yeah. Okay, so is the more these things talked about and the more they're known, Yeah. does that territorial area grow? In other words, if more is more attention is given to it, does that experience spread? You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're paying attention to it and you're out in the woods and you're like, man, I sure hope there isn't like a Wendigo out here, you know, because you, you are aware of what they are and, and you, you are knowledgeable in what they are, does just by having that sort of idea about it make it possible for whatever it is to manifest there? Yeah, but I also have that same almost flippant argument when we talk about people looking for Bigfoot sometimes. The more you talk about Bigfoot while walking through the woods, the more likely Bigfoot activity is going to happen. Right. So it goes back to what we talked about before, which was intent. Yeah. If you put the intent out there, whether consciously or subconsciously, that you're going to see something, chances are you're going to see something, right? If you feed it, it's going to show up. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm looking at when it comes to like experiences where you have an experience like, say, where people have claimed to see a, a Wendigo in Georgia when really, according to the lore and everything, you shouldn't see one that far south, ever. Or, or the deer-headed man in North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Is that a deer-headed man or is that an actual Wendigo or what is that? Yeah. So, I don't know. I, and so, that kind of leads me to this. What happens if all these shows and the internet and everything, because this is one of these subjects just in general, monsters, Bigfoot, UFO, and all that stuff. If that's spreading more cultural awareness to all of this stuff, and let's call it 14 or 14 or whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah. If that's opening up the door for more and more and more of these things to actually happen. I don't know, because for me, there are certain nuances to some of these experiences that are not being captured by internet culture. Um. And it's funny because one of our friends, Edward, he was talking about it with Bigfoot Quest, like the um, the weird pops and silence. And we've talked about that, yeah. or the flashing light. Um, but 
when some of these internet stories or creepy pastas or uh, the spread of the information fails to acknowledge certain things, that's where I feel not that well, it's not genuine, but is it? We run into the same thing. Yeah. When we talk to somebody who has had an experience and they basically bring out a detail that's so obscure that the average person wouldn't know about it. Yeah. It's kind of like when you see these television shows where they like put details of a criminal case out there that only the serial killer or they leave out the details, right? Yeah. Of a certain particular criminal case or whatever it is. But somebody comes back with a detail that only the serial killer would know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, um, lipstick on the forehead. Because in one of those shows we were watching the serial killer always kiss the forehead. And that was a detail that never went out to the public. But somebody said, you know, hey, something about a kiss on the forehead. And they're like, what? Yeah. That was a public. We didn't put that out in the public. It's got to be him. So it's kind of like when we talk to people and they talk about experiences they've had and they come up with some crazy obscure detail that most anybody who's watched anything on TV would never know because they don't spend enough time. These shows, they only go into, you know, let's talk about the Flatwoods monster for two and a half minutes. Or, you know what I mean? And then they don't have all the details and they don't put them out there. And then you come across somebody who's like, you know, no, those eyes weren't red. They were blue. Yeah. You know, you're like, or oh, yellow oh. or yeah. Well, the Flatwoods monster's eyes were blue. Oh, not red. Okay. That was the thing. I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. But it might be. I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, and it just makes me wonder if the more you feed the entire thing, the more conscious you know, people getting together and feeding the entire thing and putting the intent out there, are they having those experiences based off of that? That sort of, you know, conjoined, or let's just, no, I probably shouldn't use conjoined, but let's just say, you know, all this conscious thought going into it from all these different places, maybe it's creating some of the experiences that people are actually having. Hmm. Almost like a tulpa. So is the paranormal a tulpa? Could be. It's back in the olden days. Go back a hundred years. People were separated by distance. They didn't get any news until way, way later. Yeah. So you never heard about this sort of stuff. Or if you did, it was kept quiet or whatever, you know. But now, two minutes, somebody has an ex- a, a, a sighting or an account of something that's on Facebook, like in an hour. So then you can experience it too, you know. I don't know. We should probably talk about that. The whole helicopter view as seen on TV and the bad part of it. Well, technically we're the bad part of it because this is what we do. We do a <laughs> helicopter view of all this sort of thing and we don't put all the details out there because you, know, you can spend 30 years researching all this stuff, but it, part of that's intentional. But at least we put links to everything we talk about. Yes, yeah, so you show. can make your own. But I mean, you know, because when we go talk to people and they come up to us at like conventions and things like that and they talk about experiences they've had and they can bring out some of those details that we never talk about or that are really hard to find, then you put more weight off that interaction. It was a greenish orange tint for Flatwoods. Some say it's blue. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Because they say greenish orange tint for some, and then some say blue because it was like backlit, almost like looking through goggles. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. It's like eye shine for Bigfoot. You oh, know? yeah. What color is that? And everybody's like, we well, had glowing red eyes. Chances are that's not Bigfoot. Yeah. Glowing yellow eyes. Hmm. Or do I have that backwards? No, I don't think I do. I'll tell you what, though. If I heard a voice calling me with a harsh, raspy, analyst, animalistic in tone imitation of my sister's voice, that would freak me out. I don't have a sister. <laughs> but if I was out in the woods and she was calling me like that, guess who's like going to leave? See, because yeah. here's the deal. If we're out in the woods camping like that, I'm leaving the tent and all that stuff because chances are I bought it from a thrift store anyway. You know what I mean? Because that's the best place to buy that kind of stuff. Because you go to the thrift store and you'll find like tents and cook stoves and all stuff for dirt cheap. Because this has happened to most people. Somewhere along the lines in your family history, somebody has decided it would be a good idea to pack up all the kids and go camping. So they buy all this stuff. And it's an investment. You got the tent, sleeping bags, cooking gear, stove, all that crazy stuff. And you get all in your cooler. You pack it all together. So then you go out in the woods and you realize either A, it's amazing or B, it sucks, right? And usually what happens is it's sort of a mix in between. You know, A, on the way to B, it was a great time the first time, the second or third time kind of sucks and winds up standing in the garage forever. And then eventually, it either disappears in a yard sale or gets basically donated. And then you can go into the thrift store and buy a Coleman camp stove that normally costs you 100 bucks for like $6. 
And that's what I do, folks. <laughs> I do exactly that. So should Sasquatch or something crazy with a, you know, harshy, harsh, raspy, animalistic sister imitation voice comes out of the woods, I'm leaving all of that stuff. And get in my van, turning the key to the albino rhino, and I'm driving away. Yeah. And then I'm going to talk about it on the podcast. And people are going to be like, what would you do your tent? I'm like, I left it to nature, brother. <laughs> I and then what's going to happen? Nature. Yeah, you get in there, you know, you, you dump some water on the, on the fire, and then you leave. And then what happens? Those three guys that were walking through the woods come back, and they find a deserted campsite. They're like, what? They were just here. Missing 411. The, the coffee is still hot. What happened? And meanwhile, you're at home eating Domino's or McDonald's on the way home with fries and stuff like that. Oh, man. I don't know what that was out in the woods, but it scared me. Yeah, I don't know. And there's other stories, too, where the person that basically said that they saw the figure standing in the tree line, being tall and skinny and all that stuff, and so left them questioning what's in the woods. And this is about when my sister asked why I was so shaken, and I told her what I experienced, her face went pale. She had told me, right, before leaving, a terrifically gaunt figure had been watching us from across the riverbank. Oh, gosh. And it had noticed her and ran away on all four at a fictional speed. Fictional speed? I mean, it was super quick, I guess. And she <laughs> sacredly said, you know, and basically it frightened her for some time until after, you know, speaking the with a phrase that still haunts me today. Before I had left early, that thing had left long, deep scratch marks on a trail sign. And it was one that chased me. So her sister seen it, too. Huh. Or his sister seen it, too. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure there's a bunch of scary stories like that. I don't know. So, hey, before we get ready to wrap up the podcast, we kind of allude to the fact that there's a modern terminology that's being used to explain and kind of talk about these tall, skinny, gaunt-like figures, possibly antlers and that sort of thing. That's been called a rake. Yeah. Rake's not real. No. You remember where the entomology rake came from? Creepy pasta. Yeah, it's a creepy pasta term. Rake is not a real thing. Neither is Slender Man. Nope. So it's when somebody coins a term to use it to describe something that's already been described. There's no such thing as a rake. And there's other popular websites out there and these popular paranormal people that are using the term rake. Guess what? It doesn't exist. It's a creepy pasta. But just like we talk about with Tulpa is the fact people give this terminology credit or energy or acknowledge this term, does that make it real? Uh, no, not if it already exists as a Wendigo. Or, like, we were having a conversation about Andrew's geyser here in Old Fort, North Carolina, where it's like the guy was really, really believing that what is there is a rake. However, his description of what he thought was going on in the area was completely valid. I mean, if an elemental type energy or an elemental type creature lives at Andrew's geyser and it's been corrupted or polluted by the industrialization of that area or it's trapped there because it's a big circular rail yard, I mean, that's that's still an elemental. You mean surrounded by iron kind of a thing? Yeah, I mean, because if, if you look at, Andrew's geyser it's surrounded by railroad tracks and the place the place is like a gigantic Tibetan sound bowl when you have the rail lot or the, the yeah but I mean it, it still there. doesn't if, if yeah. rake is a term that was made up and it doesn't exist I mean then what he's calling it by an incorrect name I mean from, but if, that's what I'm saying though, yeah. so what what really is it then it's you know, is the fact that he named it it gave it energy and it became a thing I don't think so I no. think whatever's there is already there yeah it'd be called something else it's in my opinion it's a humanoid elemental you know kind of like a windigo mm. <laughs> see I don't know this is where it all becomes muddy yeah so yeah anyway I think we're just about done I think we have talked long enough what okay. Do you think? Well, I mean, is there something else you want to talk about? Uh, mm, mm, no, I guess. Well, well what? Because <laughs> according to our notes, we have gone to the point where we are pretty much done. Stuff we're talking about, like audible trials and for books and stuff that you could you know, listen to. Oh, yeah. 
So we do. Because we, we talked about the culture behind sort of the Skinwalker and how it can relate to Wendigos. And we also talk about the area between North and Midwest Canada all the way into the Southwest. Right? Yeah. We talk about some of their similarities in the simplest exp- explanation of a Wendigo. Right? Which is a human turned into a supernatural monster after mm-hmm. turning into cannibalism or dark arts. Right? Mm-hmm. Which is more towards Skinwalkers. We talked about how all that relates. We also talked about the idea of basically maybe the idea that a phenomenon is spreading due to, let's just say, cultural awareness. We talked about the possibility of a crappy show, <laughs> X-Files into a cartoon, and we also talked about Skinwalker Ranch, and that sort of tied us into Wendigo and Skinwalkers. Well, I think that's, I think that's what I'm hung up on. For the people listening to the podcast, thank you for listening this far in. For me... If you guys have these experiences, either with with some sort of trickster element, whether it's a skinwalker, a wendigo, or some sort of humanoid-type creature that's not Bigfoot, I, I want to know what you would call it. I mean, would you stick with these cultural descriptions of a skinwalker or a wendigo? Or do you have your own name or belief of what it might be? I, I want to know from y'all. So... You know, contact at creepgeeks.com. Hit us up on Facebook. Maybe we'll start a uh, Facebook discussion in our group. That's going to be Creep Geeks Facebook group. Pretty easy to find. Always feel free to hit us up. We are all over social media. We also have that contact us form. And we do want to thank our Patreon supporters for supporting us for all our podcast episodes. Specifically, Dave, Adam, James, Bobby, John, and John. Um... John, the other John, I'm saying, and Bobby, make sure we got your address because your Patreon reward needs to get into the mail. Uh, You can join us and support us on Patreon for as low as $2 a month, and there's special reward levels. Yes. Yep. Anyway, I think that's about it. Till next time. Okay. So if you've been sticking around this long, thank you very much for listening. We do appreciate it. So next episode is going to be one on one and we're probably going to talk about puck wedgies. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so if you have any questions about puck wedgies or something like that, let us know. All right. But like everything that's been happening with 2020, it's all subject to change. So, yeah. Anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.